Hey Guy from New Plastic and today we're going to keep going over practically each octane node. In the first video we covered the texture, generator and mapping node categories and in this video we'll cover all the categories from the displacement nodes to the custom pattern nodes. I'm not going to dive too deep into each one, this is more of a surface level type walkthrough except where I absolutely feel like it's necessary to stall a bit longer on an important node. If you want to support the channel, consider becoming a patron or a member, you'll get all these videos with no ads, access to the project file free products from the Gumroad store, and more cool perks. But mostly, help me make more and better content for y'all. Also, check out the new plastic Gumroad store, where you can find all sorts of material packs and model packs. I'm sure you'll find something useful for your work. And if you just want some cool prints and pins I made, check out the Pink Eye Gumroad. That's another great way to support the channel. Follow me on Instagram at Ojang or the channel at Brand New Plastic. Join our Discord, subscribe to the channel, and go watch the movie The Witch by Robert Eggert. It's a goddamn masterpiece. Let's go. So continuing where we left off, our next node is the displacement node. If we want to apply displacement on our model, we need to plug this node to the displacement channel before plugging in our texture. Another way to add this node is by going to the displacement channel and if it's empty, you'll have this add displacement button. Okay, let me copy the displacement texture for this model and paste it in here and I'll plug it into the texture slot and you can see immediately we see it affecting our model. Let's take a look at the node attributes. First, we have our displacement type. Texture will use rasterized images only, which is what we have right now. And Vertex will use procedural data to displace. We're gonna check it out in a second. Next, we have the texture we are using to displace. Then the maximum height octane will displace the model's topology, which obviously depends on your model scale. Then we have the mid-level, which dictates which point is the neutral point of the displacement. So if it's set to zero, the black areas of the texture will not be displaced and everything brighter will start displacing outwards. 0.5 will set the mid gray of the texture as the neutral topology. Everything brighter than mid gray will displace outwards and everything darker will displace inwards. And one will use the whites as the neutral point and everything darker will only displace inwards. Different height textures will require different mid levels so it all depends on your height texture but you're most likely to use either 0 or 0 0.5. In this case you can see 0 is what we need. Next we have level of detail which is the resolution of your displacement map. You want to make sure this matches the resolution of your texture but if you're stuck with a low resolution texture, you can try to increase the level of details and Octane will do its best to improve the resolution. Next we have the displacement direction which dictates what's the vector or direction of the displaced topology. You should probably leave it at smooth normals which will follow the smooth normal directions of your polygons and let me increase the height so we see the effect better. Vertex normal will follow the direction of each vertex and geometric normal will follow the normal direction of your polygons without fong smoothing, which you can see kind of breaks the texture around each polygon. Filter type adds a blur to your texture if you need one, either box blur or Gaussian blur, which are just different blur algorithms. Gaussian looks a bit better, but takes a bit more resources to calculate and increasing the filter radius basically increases the blur amount. So you can see if I increase the blur and exaggerate the height, the displacement is much smoother. Now, if I plug a procedural noise into the texture slot, nothing will happen because we need to change the type to vertex displacement. Now you can see the procedural noise is displacing the topology. All these first attributes are the same as texture displacement, except now we have map type, where height type will use a black and white map to displace only up and down, and vector allows you to use a vector displacement map, which is much more complex and can displace in all different directions. You need special vector maps for that and a ton of geometry to make it look good. I don't think Octane is ready for vector displacements yet. Then you have the vector space, Object uses the X, Y, and Z directions of your object, and Tangent uses the normal directions of your surface. Input axes changes the order of the displacement axes. Honestly, I never see any difference with any of these. Autobomb takes the detail of your texture and uses them as a bump map. This is a great way to quickly add details without needing to actually displace the topology in such a detailed way. Part of the reason is that unlike texture displacement, which kind of fakes displacement using voxels, vertex displacement actually uses your model's geometry to displace it. So the more detail you want the displacement to be, the more geometry you need, which can get heavy. Which leads me to the final attribute, 
subdivision level. Upping this will actually subdivide your model, just like adding a subdivision surface, which will allow for more detailed displacement. The increase in geometry is exponential, so depending on your initial polygon count, you can easily end up with tens or hundreds of millions of polygons at higher subdivision levels. So it will take a lot of VRAM to get a very detailed displacement. Next node is the vertex displacement mixer, where you can plug in several different vertex displacement nodes and mix them up to achieve a very complex displacement system. So I'll just quickly plug this noise into a UVW transform and scale it up, which as we learned now gives us two noises in two different scales. Plug this one into a separate vertex displacement node and plug it into the displacement two slot. Now I can use the blend slider to bring the opacity down of the second layer and mix between the two layers or plug a black and white texture to mask it out. So now you can see the black parts of the mask removes this displacement layer and reveals the first displacement layer. Really cool. Okay, next we have the black body emission node. This node plugs into the emission channel and makes our surface emissive. I just turned off the HDRI to make the environment dark. So the significant thing about this emission node is that it's based on the Kelvin temperature scale. Let's start with the power slider, which is the intensity of the light set in wattage. So 100 power is kind of like a 100 watts light. Now, the temperature sets the tone of the light. Lower temperatures will create a warmer light and higher temperatures will create a cooler light. Neutral light is somewhere between 5500 and 6500. We can also add a color node and plug it into the texture slot. Now the temperature will change the tone of the input texture. In this case, cooler pink or warmer pink. Should have probably used the Gaussian spectrum. But we can also plug any image or noise map here to get more texture. If surface brightness is checked, the light intensity will change according to the object scale. So you can see as the object gets smaller, the light it casts grows weaker. If surface brightness is unchecked, the light intensity will stay at the set power. So you can see even if the object is really, really small, it still acts at a 15 wattage intensity, which feels more intense because it's smaller. As the object grows bigger, that power distributes along a larger surface area, so it seems weaker. Keep instance power, not sure what it does. The info about it is super murky. If you know what it is, let us know in the comments. Double-sided means the light will shine from both sides of the polygon, so in this case, it will shine on the inside of the object as well. If this was a flat polygon, you would have seen the light coming from both sides. If normalize is unchecked, the light intensity will grow weaker as the temperature goes down, just like in real life. So in lower temperatures, you would have to really increase the power. I always keep normalize checked. You can add a texture to the distribute slot to break up the surface of the light, kind of like gobos do in real life. So you can see if I crank up the contrast on this noise, we're breaking up the light in all the black areas. And you probably want to play with the projection on it. Increasing the sampling rate cleans up the sample noise on your light, but at the expense of other lights in your scene. So you're basically telling Octane to dedicate more samples to this light compared to another light in your scene out of your overall scene samples. You're not adding more samples to the render. You're dedicating more samples to this light out of your overall samples. Light ID assigns an ID number to your light so you can prevent it from lighting certain objects as an AOV pass, as you can see here. Disabling visible on specular will remove the light specular reflections from reflective surfaces. Disabling visible on diffuse will remove the light diffused reflections from the surfaces. Transparent emission has to do with opacity, so let's plug this noise into the opacity channel. And now we have this partially invisible light object. If we uncheck transparent emission, and maybe just increase the blacks of the noise to make it a bit more invisible. You can see other reflective surfaces reflect only the visible parts of the light source. With transparent emission checked, the whole object is reflected regardless of its opacity. And let's turn on this plane here. You can see the light is obviously casting a shadow behind the plane. However, if we turn off cast shadows, it won't cast any shadows. And lastly, at the top of the node here, you have the option to turn this into an IES light. If you click on it, Octane will plug an image texture node with a projection node into the distribution channel, where you can upload an IES file, which is a special file that has different realistic light distribution information in it. It won't really work that well on this intricate object. This will probably work best on a flat plane, disk, or a sphere. Okay, next node we have is the texture emission node, which is practically the same as the black body node, except here we can set a temperature. We can only use a texture to drive the light color and texture. So if we want a solid color, we can use the Gaussian spectrum as we learned or connect an image texture and use it as a light source. The rest is the same as the black body emission. If you want to get a more detailed breakdown of the Octane light features, check out the first episode of my light series.
Okay, now we got the medium nodes. First one is the absorption medium node, which we connect to the medium channel. And to activate it, we need to turn on transmission. And you can see we're getting some light absorption in our object. And we can plug a color node into the absorption slot to tell Octane to essentially absorb all the colors except this one, which is why we see the color reflected back from the object. We can set the density of the object, which will dictate how much light will be absorbed. So the lower it is, the less light will be absorbed and more transparent the object will be. The higher, the more light will be absorbed, meaning the color not absorbed will be stronger. Volume step length has to do only with volume medium, so don't worry about this now. And unchecking invert absorption will tell Octane to actually absorb the color set in the absorption slot, showing us the inverted color instead, which is actually how it works in real life. It's set to invert by default since it's probably a bit less confusing and gives us more control over the outcome. Next is the scattering medium, which has the exact same features as the absorption medium, except now we have the options for scattering, phase, and emission. Plugging the color node into the absorption will do the same thing as the previous node, but if we plug a different color to the scattering slot, now we have the cyan color not absorbed and the orange color scattering within the object. Let's actually turn the albedo black so we're getting full transmission. And if I increase the density, you can see the not absorbed color and the scattering color kind of mixing inside the object. If we use a full white color in the scattering, we're telling Octane to scatter all the light immediately as it hits the surface resulting in a much more diffused and less transparent look, which we should actually better use a float node for. So higher float values will create heavy, quick scattering and a more opaque look, and lower values will create lower scattering and a more transparent look. Phase set to 1 results in the scattered light coming more towards the camera, which emphasizes the effect. Phase set to 0 results in the light moving more away from the camera, so we essentially get less of the scattering effect. And 0.5 makes the scattered light go in all directions. And emission is just like the emission channel we went over earlier, actively emitting light from within the object. Next, we'll look at the random walk medium node, which is similar to the scattering but uses a different algorithm. Here we have the albedo channel which is the color we see being reflected from the object and scattered in it then we have the radius which tells octane how deep the light travels inside before being scattered so lower values will scatter the light immediately resulting in a much more dense looking object as we increase the radius the object feels less dense and we can see the edges being more transparent and actually maybe it's better if i make it a specular transmission so we see the transparent areas more clearly so yeah bringing down density makes it even much more transparent now we can plug a color node into the radius which will show us that color being scattered inside before being absorbed. As for the bias, a very simple way to look at it is bias set to 1 will lean towards a more opaque albedo look, bias set to 0 leans more towards a scattered effect, and 0.5 mixes between the two. Okay, for the next node, I added a VDB object. I have nothing in the volume medium channel, so I'll click on the node editor here and I'll add the volume medium node to the medium channel. And immediately we can see something. We can set the density of the voxel, so lower density will give clearer smoke and higher density will give us a more opaque smoke. Lowering the volume step length will increase the resolution of the voxels, so the more details you have in your volume, the lower this number should be. And it's closely dependent on the density, so play with both simultaneously, preferably starting with lower density. Unchecking the lock step length will allow you to input a different number for the shadow ray step, which calculates the shadow rays inside the volume. Just keep it checked unless you really know what you're doing. Single scatter amount determines how often a direct light is calculated in the volume, according to Octane. Not seeing any huge difference, leave it as is unless you really know what you're doing. In the displacement, we can add an OSL displacement node, which will allow you to add further detail to your volume using noise. Increasing the amount and displacer will increase the intensity. Increasing the frequencies will reduce the scale of the distortion. You can also use a noise 4D node here. Adding a color node to the absorption channel will tell Octane which color not to absorb, which will make the volume reflect back that color. Using the darker color will result in a very opaque look. Lighter color will result in a very transparent look since no colors are absorbed. Adding lighter color to the scattering channel will tell Octane to scatter all the light quicker, resulting in a denser look. Darker colors will make the scattering happen slower, so more light goes through, becoming more transparent. And the color used will be the color scattered inside the volume. So you can see lighter scattering colors and darker absorption will result in a more opaque dark volume with more diffused edges. Face is the same as in the scattering medium. Adding an emission node to the emission channel will add light to the volume and we can add a Gaussian spectrum to the texture slot to give it color. Or we can use the next node, which is the volume gradient node. 
This will assign the left notch to the denser parts of your volume and the right notch to the lighter parts. We can choose a gradient preset and now we'll get a more varied look to the fire in this example based on the fuel information of the VDB. And we can adjust the max value to assign the middle point of the gradient, shifting from the darker areas to the lighter areas. The next node is the standard volume medium, which does the same thing, but in this way that mirrors the new standard surface approach started by Autodesk. First, let me change the emission node to none. Density is the same as the previous node. The difference is that here I can set the exact density channel used in my VDB instead of having to rely on this VDB tab. Interpolation sets the voxel interpolation mode, just leave it as trilinear. Volume step length is the same as previous, also connected to the density. Volume shadow ray, single scatter amount, lock step length, and displacement are the same as the previous node. Scatter weight determines the amount of scattering, and scatter color determines the color of the scattered light. So we get a bit more nuanced control here. Anisotropy is the same as phase, higher is a more pronounced effect, lower is less, and we can set the density channel for the scattering here as well. Transmission weight and depth determines how transparent the volume is, so I guess it's similar to absorption, and you can add the channel here, and you can see how all these attributes are kind of dependent on each other. Emission mode allows us to choose how the emission will be calculated, so channel uses the channel selected here, density uses the density channel and black body will allow us to use these temperature settings down here so down here checking the auto scale will map the max value of the temperature set in the black body emission so up here in the black body kelvin we can set the kelvin temperature increase the light intensity and i think my emission channel is called flames so you can see i'm getting a different emission calculation that i think looks better and we can also use the volume gradient here as well so yeah this allows for more control and gives us slightly different results than the previous volume node okay done with the medium nodes next one is the rounded edges node and for this one we need to activate the rounded edges channel in the material and either click on this button to add the node or just plug the node here so if we increase the radius and add the material to the cube we're kind of faking these rounded edges we can bring down the roundness to make the edges more flat beveled. Accurate mode will give us a slightly better look, especially as you increase the radius. Convex will make the edges convex and concave will make them concave. And consider others is similar to the curvature node where it will round the edges of two different objects intersecting. This effect works best from a distance since it doesn't really round the geometry, it just fakes it kind of like a bum map. But if you have a ton of geometry you're trying to round, that's a great way to do it without adding more geometry to actually round your edges. Okay, next we have the great composite texture node, which allows us to blend two or more layers together. Once we click add layer, we get this other composite texture node which is the second node on the list so let's plug in this image to layer one and plug an rgb node to layer two and all we see now is layer two because we didn't set any blending so here we have the layer input then we have the opacity settings then in the blend mode we have a ton of different blending options from the familiar photoshop ones to all sorts of obscure ones test them out i'm not going to go over each and every one another thing we can do is add a texture to the opacity that acts as a mask or an alpha so now the black parts of this noise mask out this layer. I'll set the noise to Voronoi so we get all these different grayscale values. And I'll actually also add a noise mask to the bottom layer. So now the bottom layer has these black areas where it's masked out. Okay, overlay mode determines how this layer is mixed with the bottom layer. In this list, source is referring to the top layer and destination is referring to the bottom layer. The default source over simply blends between the two layers as usual. Source ignores the bottom layer, blending the top layer with a black color. Source conjoint over only shows the top layer if it partially obscures the bottom layer. It's really hard to tell, honestly. Source disjoint over ignores the overlap between the two layers. Also really hard to tell. Source in will only show the parts of the top layer that overlap with the bottom layer. Source out is the opposite, only showing the top layer where it's not overlapping with the bottom layer. Source atop shows the bottom layer where the layers overlap along with the rest of the top layer. Destination only shows the bottom layer. Destination over places the bottom layer over the top layer, essentially reversing the layer order. Destination in only shows the bottom layer where it overlaps with the top layer. So you can see the stronger the top layer mask is, the more we see the bottom layer. Destination out is the opposite, only showing the bottom layer where it doesn't overlap with the top layer. Destination atop 
shows the bottom layer where it overlaps with the top layer along with the rest of the top layer. Clear simply ignores both layers, showing black. XOR will show both top and bottom layers where they don't overlap. Dissolve uses the top layer's mask as a noise threshold. The stronger the alpha is, the more dense the noise is. I love Dissolve. Plus gives us the sum of the pre-multiplied colors of the two layers, including the alpha values, clamped to zero and one. Matte is the same as the default source over, except it ignores the bottom layer's alpha. Okay, and the last thing we can do here is determine the behavior of the alpha channel, the mask channel. Alpha compositing simply uses the alpha as expected. Blend mode uses the blend mode and applies that to the alpha channels. So you can see if the blend mode is set to normal, each layer is masked against a black background. Background uses the bottom layer's alpha as the top layer's mask. Foreground uses the top layer's mask as the bottom layer's mask. One sets the layer's alpha to one, and zero sets the layer's alpha to zero. Next, we have the custom texture nodes, starting with the capture AOV nodes. So first off, you can see in my live viewer, I have added a custom AOV one to my AOV list. And in the node, I made sure it's set to the right custom AOV number. I'll plug the image to the override slot, plug it into the albedo channel and nothing happens. But if I plug the image to the capture texture, now I'm getting this image as my albedo. But because it's plugged into the override slot, I'm also getting it as a pure diffuse map in my custom AOV pass. So essentially this node allows me to use a texture as part of the material, as as well as isolated into a custom AOV pass. Next, we have all these float nodes, which I'm just going to add all three at once. The float to grayscale node is similar to the regular node where I can use this slider as a grayscale value and as a numerical data value output, which can also be driven by Expresso. Float to color converts three separate float values into an RGB value, which can also be used as XYZ inputs if you know what you're doing and also be driven by Expresso. And float three to color, which does the same thing except Except here it's a single three-dimensional value instead of three separate ones. Again, these are less used for coloring and mostly used as data drivers like using Espresso to make them drive rotational position and scale values. Next is the volume to texture node. Here I can add a VDB object, then choose the specific channel from the VDB that you want to use. And then we can add a transform node and scale the volume. And you can see we're getting this black and white map that is affected by the volume object. And maybe we want a different channel like a mission or add a different projection to make it fit differently on your geometry or adjust the VDB animation if you have it. Next, we have the gradient generator node that as you can see automatically fits the object's UVs. I can add a transform node and scale it. I can change the type to radial for a radial gradient, which is a bit hard to see on this object. I can assign different projections as well. I can change the angular type, which actually, let me put it on a flat plane as well, just so it's easier to see. There you go. So now you can clearly see the angular gradient. We have polygonal, which has this sharp rectangular spread. We have spiral, which is simply a spiral gradient. We can change the repetition, which is a different way to scale it by adding more loops to an area. Polygon sides will affect the polygonal type and add more sides to the shape and gamma affects the luminosity of the gradient transition, either increasing the black values or increasing the white values. Gamma set at one will give us a linearized gradient. We can invert it and we can change the repetition mode to mirror, which is similar to a triangle wave. Black, which clamps the gradient on its black side. White clamps the gradient on its white side and clamp clamps both white and black sides. So yeah, play around with it. Super convenient way to add gradient and create patterns. Next, we have the math binary node. And let me actually quickly add this gradient node to argument B. So this node allows us to add two different inputs and apply a mathematical equation to them. Since at the end of the day, color values are numbers. So grayscale values are just numerical float values that are either zero to one, but can go beyond one and below zero. So if I add this checker node to input a, you can see we're now using the add operation, which simply adds the numbers together, making them brighter, essentially. But you can get really, really sophisticated patterns just by using the right inputs and the right equations. I mean, most of this math is beyond me, so there's no way I can explain each one. But really, it's all about taking the data numbers represented by the colors in input A and applying the equation on the data numbers represented by the colors in input B. Next, we have the math unary or uniary nodes 
which does the same thing except applying a math operation on a single output. So here, for example, we're only getting the absolute values of this gradient, converting any negative values to positive values. And there are many different operations. Some of them are more obvious than others. If you know math or do programming or are familiar with the math nodes in Blender, then you probably know what each one of those do more than I do. Next, we have the normal node, which gives us an RGB texture of your model's normal directions. Geometric uses the non-smooth, no fong shading. Smooth gives us the smooth fong shading, and shading will take into account any bump or normal maps you have in your material. So you can see if I add a bump map, it shows on the RGB texture. We can either use the world coordinate space, which will use the 000, 000 point of your scene. Object will use your object's axis point. Tangent will be relative to each polygon's direction. And camera will use the camera space. And you can normalize the result, which essentially clamps the vector values from zero to one. Next, we have the position node, which creates an RGB texture of your object's position. You can either choose world coordinates, which relates to your scene's 000 point, camera, which relates to your camera's center point, and object, which relates to your object's origin point. So you can see the position vectors don't change really as you move the object set to object coordinates because it always relates to itself. While in world mode, the RGB will shift according to the object's world space. Next, we have the random map node. Here we can plug a texture to the value input. And as we increase the input scale, we can see we're adding random values based on the grayscale values of our input. And we have different functions which will generate different looks. Perlin clamps the range from negative one to one. Unsigned Perlin clamps the values from zero to one. Cell gives us these sharp stepped values from zero to one. And hash uses a really, really fine hash noise. Next, we have the range node, which allows us to use a texture and remap its values both as it goes in and as it goes out. Linear interpolation will just use the full range of the numbers to get a smooth transition. Steps uses a non-smooth transition divided by the levels set down here. So as we increase the levels, we're getting more values. Smooth steps does the same thing, except it applies smoothing after. And smoother steps does exactly the same thing using a different algorithm. And posterize does a similar thing as steps. And clamp clamps the input values. Next node is the ray direction node, which gives us an RGB texture based on an incoming ray. If view direction is checked, the direction is calculated from the viewing position. If unchecked, the direction is calculated from the opposite direction. Coordinate space set to world is your scene's 000 point for calculations. Camera uses the camera center point. Object uses the orientation of your object. And tangent uses your surface's normal directions. X and Y relating to your U and V lines. And Z uses your polygon's face direction and normalized results clamps the vectors values from 0 to 1 next node is relative distance which creates a grayscale gradient between your object and the transformation point set here in this slot so if I input a transform node I can move it around and you can see the black point of the gradient is shifting in relation to its distance from the object distance mode gives us this spherical gradient that goes towards all axes so you can see the effect if I move it all around x-axis only uses a linear gradient along the x-axis, y only on the y-axis, and z only on the z-axis, which is almost like a z-depth map. If we check full transform, the gradient will also be affected by the scale and rotation of the transform point, not just the translation. Turning on normalized result will clamp the gradient values to whatever you set in the range min and range max down here, both positive or negative values. And for example, you can use Expresso to assign a different object to affect these transform nodes and apply this effect essentially between two separate objects. Next, we have the sample position node, which is similar to position, except it only uses the screen coordinates and only uses R and G values between negative one and one. So it's almost like a UV tile placed on your screen and you're moving your object along the tile, painting it the color related to the coordinate only. The only attribute we have in this node is selecting different nodes from the list. So let's just move to the next node, which we can also just access from the main node list, the surface tangent DPDU node. This uses the world space and assigns an RGB texture based on the surface tangents along the U axis only. The surface tangent DPDV node does the same thing, but along the V axis of your UV map. It's a bit hard to get it when the UV map is split up like this, but if we look at this cube, you can see the RGB values of each surface tangent along the different axes of the UV map, including the noise variation coming from the bump channel. Honestly, I have zero idea how to make use of this. 
Next, we have the Z-Depth Pass, which creates a grayscale gradient based on your camera's space's Z-Depth. And with normalized results checked, we can clamp the minimum and maximum range depending on how much depth you want to capture in the gradient, just like when you set your Z-Depth Pass. And for even more control, you can add a gradient node and further dial in the depth, especially in cases like this where we only have one object and barely any depth to capture in the scene. Okay, last one of the custom texture nodes is the UV coordinate node. This paints an RGB texture based on your UV map. So 0, 0 will be black, 0, 1 green, 1, 0 red, and 1, 1 yellow. And you can change your tile number if you have more than one or change the max values of the data. You can use this node to get access to your surface coordinates. And by using all the different channel mapping nodes and math nodes we went over, you can get really, really, really sophisticated and fully procedural patterns and textures in theory. I don't think Octane for Cinema 4D is ready for this sophistication yet unfortunately unless you know something I don't which you probably do okay whew. next node category is the custom pattern nodes a lot of cool stuff here all procedurally based patterns first one is the chainmail node which creates this interlocking chainmail pattern in these nodes we have all the different pattern nodes as a list here which are the same as the list in the main node list and then all the attributes for that specific node so here we can change the radius of each ring and the width of each ring and really get crazy cool patterns. And of course, assign a transform and projection node to affect the pattern as a whole. Next is the color squares node, which is a simple pattern of these colored squares. Next is the flakes node, which gives us this spotted pattern, which is mostly used on the normal channel to get a glitter effect or a certain car paint effect. We can change each flake size, how much they blend with the background and the randomness of the size. If we really increase the size and reduce the randomness, we'll start to get this colored Voronoi effect. Next, we have the fractal pattern, which is just a simple fractal pattern. Next, we have glowing circles, which unlike the name, gives us a single glowing circle. We can change the circle radius and its width. Next is the haggle slag, which I love. Literally a procedural chocolate sprinkles node. We can change the density of the sprinkles, change the random seed, change the width of each sprinkle, and the length of each sprinkle and we can also assign a texture to mask out parts of the texture and break it up this is great for procedural scratches for example especially when adding a distortion to the sprinkles using the distortion uv projection node next is the iridescent node which uses a colored gradient to kind of fake an iridescent look we can change the colors here shift the gradient along the surface using the thickness settings change the exponent and frequency settings to make the gradient more or less dense adding a noise to the gradient with the noise frequency and scaling the noise with the noise scale. The more noise, the less defined the gradient will be. Changing the period offset will change the starting point of the gradient and iridescent weight changes the saturation of the gradient. This is honestly a really great alternative to using the thin film channel, which can be really finicky and hard to control. Next, we have the Moir Mosaic or the Moiré Mosaic, depends how fancy you want to be. This gives us a simple repeating pattern of different shapes. Size controls the size of each shape. Corner radius doesn't affect the rectangles. Neither does blur. Shift offsets every other line. And the rest of these don't affect the rectangles either. We can also change the shape to circles. Corner radius still won't affect them. Now the blur does work. We can change to a ring shape, which let's make sure it's the right size. There you go. And now we can affect the spacing between each ring along the X and Y axes, blur them out. And if we scale the whole thing down, you can see the rings have this radial oscillating effect where they slowly change radius along the surface. That's just what they do. You can turn it off, making them completely uniform, but you can get really cool patterns playing with these numbers. And by changing the time setting, you can offset the oscillation and kind of make them breathe. Same thing with the frame shape, except these rings have a slightly different oscillating effect. Next, we have a whole new subcategory called procedural effects with its own list of effects. First, we have the combustible Voronoi, which gives us this fiery tunnel effect. And all we can affect is the evolution of the pattern. Other ones on the list are the block K product, the Blosh product, with this psychedelic pattern, the candle flame that moves like a flame as we change the time value. Great for a quick and easy candle flame when also plugged into the opacity channel. The fire emitter, fractal one, fractal two, which is the same as the other fractal patterns we looked at, doesn't evolve though. Fractal three, kaleidoscope, mist, neon stripes, 
noise smoke flow, which kind of mimics a simple smoke look moving around. Paint colors, which looks better when you don't see the repeating pattern. Particles, which kind of looks like stars in space. Portal. Skinner, I don't know. Sun surface. Star scroller for that moving through space effect you always wanted. Tunnel. Wavy colors, which looks better zoomed in. And these two volumetric effects, which should work on volumes, but I tried and either I'm missing something or they don't really work. Okay, the next one is the stripes node. This gives us these overlapping stripes. We can change the color of the stripes and the background, blur them out and change the width of each stripe. And you can get all sorts of simple but cool patterns with this one. Tile pattern gives us different types of tiles. You can change the line width the colors of the tiles and get different types of tiles from the default bricks, fancy tiles, hexagon, scales, triangles, and Voronoi. Adding imperfections and using the distort UV projection node with these will get you very far in creating nice and realistic procedural tiles. Next is the Voronoi Smooth Contours, which has this wavy Voronoi noise. Upping the frequency adds more contour lines and time makes the pattern evolve. Checking Glossy adds this saw wave pattern to the transitions. Next is the Circle Spirals. You can increase the amount of circles, increase their spread out, increase their radius, and kind of make them evolve. Digits lays out these procedural old school digital numbers. You can change the number, change the amount of digits, Decimals adds more decimal digits. You can change the colors and remove those ghost lines. Star field basically adds this fine particle noise. You can change the density. Increase the brightness randomness with the fall off. And temperature only works when spectral is turned on, which makes some of them colored, kind of like stars. And then you can increase the range of the temperature, which randomly gives them warmer tones or cooler tones. Fan spiral gives us a spiral gradient. We can rotate, we can twist it using very low numbers. We can increase the gradient repetitions. Next is the fractal flow noise, which is a 3D noise with a unique directional flow to it. Flow kind of shifts and evolves the noise. Lacunarity changes the size of the gaps in the noise. Flow rate affects the flow coordinates. Gain changes the noise contrast. Advection kind of stretches the noise along the flow directions. Octaves increase the frequency of the noise, adding more detail. Attenuation is almost like gamma, affecting the luminance of the noise. And checking the step noise makes the transitions stepped or quantized or posterized, however you want to call it. Not smooth. Next is the fractal noise. Time evolves the noise. Octaves adds frequencies or details. Distortion applies further distortion to the fractal pattern. Lacunarity affects the gap size in the noise. Gain changes the contrast. Checking Turbulent adds another layer of noise, theoretically, but doesn't look like anything is happening. Now up here the mode is set to Scalar, which is just a simple black and white noise. We can change the mode to Vector, and now we're getting these RGB colors which contain directional information as well. Next is the Snow Effect, which is this soft snowflakes effect. We can evolve it with the time setting, change the flakes radius, change the flakes amount, and change the direction from which the flakes are coming. Next is the road fractal, which is a fractal pattern with rotational data. Changing the time rotates the fractals around, and iterations changes the amount of fractal iterations, essentially adding more or less detail. Next is the scratches, which is a great node, adding this random pattern of curved lines. Right now you can see the repeating pattern, but as soon as we change the seed, it appears more randomly spread out. Layer count adds more layers of line in different sizes, curls randomly curves them around, rotation randomly changes their orientation, frequency condenses them along each axis, and steps assigns different frequencies to different layers. Next is rain bump, which fakes these raindrops ripples, time evolves the ripple animation, rain count determines the amount of rings for each raindrop but this setting is broken, ring size determines the maximum size of each raindrop before it fades out. Density controls the amount of overall raindrops, but this setting is broken. Strength sets the white intensity. Random seed controls the random seed. And sharpness controls the sharpness or contrast of the ripples. And the last note here is the tripper note, which gives us this psychedelic mosaic pattern. 
and you can make it evolve with the time setting and change the color combination. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I was hoping to knock all the rest of these nodes in one video, but it ended up being way too long, so we're going to have to have a final part three to this series. If you notice any mistakes or inaccuracies, feel free to comment. I'm really trying my best to get everything I can right, but some stuff are so obscure with little to no information about them, and my knowledge is extremely limited, so corrections are always welcome. Check out the Gumroad store for cool texture and model packs, and the other Gumroad store for cool prints and pins. Consider supporting on patreon or membership and a resounding thank you to all the niftiest patrons and members who help make these videos come to life i love you have a great day